I don't know. Hello, uh, welcome to the episode 11 of Techno Crime Fighters Forum. Today we have our our usual uh, panel here. We're waiting for Melissa Nelson, but we have Karen and we have Ka Dr. Catherine Horton and we have Ramola D. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna introduce them today because you need to go to a previous forum. These are all TIs currently being hit while you're watching them uh, with energy weapons. Today the topic is probably going to probably going to focus on Millicent's case. Uh, but before we get started with that, uh, Dr. Catherine Horton has some announcements to make. Catherine. Um, yes, so I wanted to first of all apologize for the background that is because of the attacks because one of the things that has happened I'm, I'm in Switzerland right now in Zurich and um, what um, the head of um, Swiss intelligence is Marcus Seiler and what Marcus Seiler has authorized is uh, Essentially electromagnetic machine gun shots into my body every single night So now when I go to bed, I already sleep under shielding, but they just um, open um, fire and already Ramola and um, Karen and I, we discussed that when they do that, you can actually hear the shots bounce off um, shielding. And I have put um, a video up online on my YouTube channel where people who are victims of this and um, don't know what it sounds like and don't know what it looks like, you can actually have a look. Um, let me just find it whilst I speak. But um, essentially now, every single night when I go to bed, um, if my shielding isn't perfect, um, it starts off with as soon as I lie down, I suddenly hear popping sounds in my body, all over my body as the microwave energy of the pulse is shot into my body. The tissue briefly expands under the heat and there's this popping sound, which is uh, essentially cavitation. So bubble formations and the tissue expanding. And um, what this does to, to a human body is that bit by bit it rips holes into the, um, into the body. And um, I would like to briefly share, just for other victims who have experienced this, because this is truly horrific, I just would like to show you my screen. If you go to my um, channel, sorry, I think, um, I think some microphones are on, off, on in the background. So let me just share my um, screen. Oops, sorry, I can just see my wall. So um, if you go to my um, YouTube channel, Stop007, and you go to videos, you will see something like this. And if you go down to these images where I, I'm sitting shielded and totally wrapped up and you click on this called audible and visible shots bouncing off shielding, in the first 20 seconds, I'll show you what to look for. I had to put this over my shoulder. Did you hear that? So that there was, was one shot already shielding. and there will be a second shot. I'm just shot. sitting perfectly still. I'm not touching anything. My hand is here. This is the first 20 seconds. That was a shot of the shot. There was a That's second shot and the third brain. shot here in the shoulder area. Just listen you to can it. see a because dent appear. There'll be more. Here. And now I'm not using the measuring device. It should be literally in a few seconds. Arm and my arm is being shot into so hard, it's so painful, but I'm not going to move. Because if you're quiet, you can hear the shots when they hit the shielding. They try to yeah. not hit the shielding, of course. I'll look at what, um, oh, it's at, it's at 19 seconds, I think. Oh, that's right, hang on. Now. Let me just show you because this is really spectacular. So I want to say that if you're collecting evidence for court, um, you can actually measure this, sorry. So this was the second shot that happened. You can hear it and you can also see it on shielding. I've just got um, baking foil, so aluminum foil on my shoulder. And if you go to 17 seconds in the um, in the video and then focus on this area of my shoulder, you can see that a, a dent is being put here, there, that was a shot exactly the where, shot. where the That's cursor I mean. is. Like so um, all, the reason why I'm saying that is that it is possible. Um, sorry, did you actually see that? Did you see my screen? Okay, fantastic. So um, I just want people to know that you can show these shots and I want you to actually um, in your mental eye, just imagine what incredible energy goes into this pulse th that if you don't have metal, um, like aluminium, as a barrier, so um, the reason why there's a dent is because the shot bounces off. And just as if you had just hit a tennis ball against shielding, you put a dent in. That's the recoil. So the, the shot bounced off. But if you don't have metal to protect yourself, that shot is being punched into your body. 
and the entire microwave energy makes your tissue pop. This is leading bit by bit to tissue damage. And what the intelligence agencies are doing is that they're shooting with these shots. These are proper, proper gunshots into people's organs and into people's heads. And the idea is tissue degeneration and neurological degeneration. So that's, that's just to put it in context. I, I see that Millicent has just joined us. Hello. Good morning. You know, I had my tablet and my phone with me all throughout the house, and I did not hear your, uh, your call until just about three minutes ago. Okay, so you haven't you haven't missed anything. I was just um, talking about um, one of the um, um, uh, I was talking about the attacks on me, and we wanted to spend just briefly the beginning to make a couple of announcements. So I just announced that um, the attacks on me have gone absolutely insane. So every single night, my I, my body is absolutely riddled with electromagnetic gunshots. The one I've just shown. Um, also, I received a letter. I requested my file from the Zurich Cantonal Police because I've contacted the criminal police in Zurich and I requested that they um, give me my, my file, so all the file entries. And what I got back is something to behold. It is, it is Swiss criminal police corruption put into print because what they sent back, so I'm just going to show this here. So you get back a letter like that and down here, you have, they have listed four of the five times I've been to the police station. And I will put this online, by the way, I just have to edit out my private address. But I went to the police five times, they only list four, and every of the four times that appears here, I went there with something else. The first time I reported the break-in. The second time, uh, the break-in and the, the very first time, you know, microwave attacks to my body that actually burned my hand and my foot. What do they write down into the um, computer system? In German, they wrote down Verdacht auf psychische Veränderung. In English, that means suspicion of a psychological change. Wow. You report a break-in and they suspect you've psychologically changed. How the F would they know? They don't know me. How, do they have a before and after? So anyway, that's to start. Next time I go back a month later, this was January 2016, a month later, I go back and I print them off a Google Maps map of where my house is and I highlight all the properties from which I'm being shot at. And over the past year, I confirmed that that's where pretty much these, you know, these people are, where they've corrupted neighbors. So I give them a freaking map so that these little, you know, um, lightheaded people don't have too hard to work to find these things. What do they write down? Suspicion of a psychological change. Okay, okay. Then I don't turn up there because they were useless for about seven months. I go back in October and I say, look, I've got here my court, my court bundle. Um, this, these are all the cases, entire lists of victims who have been murdered or publicly executed with electromagnetic weapons, newspaper articles that people are being attacked by neighbors in their private homes, entire press articles by MI6 agents, you know, Carl Clark, who said in the press that, yes, the intelligence agencies are attacking people with electromagnetic weapons. I give this pack to the police. What do they write into their computer system? Suspicion of a psychological change. The same four words. It gets even better. The last time we go to the police, uh, sorry, the last time we had an argument inside my home and the perp neighbors are watching our, my, the inside of my home nonstop. So my husband and I, we had an argument. Okay, we became very loud, like arguments are, especially if you're Eastern European. And then the neighbors called the Swiss police. So the Swiss police turn up because of a domestic argument and um you know and then also the police they said that to the police that my husband attacked me with a chair okay so that's the police that's why the police is called out they come and we say what is this about no we don't need you it's okay you know get lost and then what happens they write down for me suspicion of a psychological change what like whatever you report to the zurich cantonal criminal police they will just assume you've psychologically changed. Well, that's either they are that fucking stupid or they're that flaming corrupt. And I don't think anybody can be that flaming corrupt. So that is just a prelude. So I have got actually black and white evidence for Zurich police corruption. I'm so glad that they sent it to me. But 
the really big announcement is, and it ties in with what I just said, um, I've received a report by Frédéric Laroche. He's a victim in France, and he's been a victim for 20 years. And I would like to, sh um, to share my screen again, because I want to show you um, who Frédéric Laroche is. If you go to um, the uh, URL www.covertharassmentconference.com, you will get to this website of the Covert Harassment Conference that um, took place in 2014 and 2015. 2014 saw the um, NSA whistleblower William Binney speak at the conference. So we're not talking a crackpot conference here. This is really about actual intelligence agency crimes. And then um, there was also Dr. Ronnie Kilder who spoke at, in 2000. Um, 14 and three months later she was she was executed in Norway she died in in uh, Finland but she um, you know pertained the uh, life-threatening injuries in Norway so I blame Norwegian um, intelligence but anyway so it's a pretty high profile conference and if you go to the sidebar here you will find Frederick Laroche there so he spoke and you get down to the page and Frederick Laroche is this guy here you can see him here so he spoke in 2015 okay at this conference and he said how he's being harassed by french intelligence exactly in the same way we're all being um, harassed by the intelligence agencies around the world and as part of the tsunami email campaign he has contacted um he has contacted all members sorry let me just switch back all members of the um swiss parliament because he said he informed them that now the tsunami email campaign is global we are informing um, people everywhere around the globe. And he wanted to draw attention to his particular case that is already, you know, two decades old, pretty much. And he said he contacted every single member of French parliament. So the, so the good news is the French parliament cannot claim they don't know about these crimes against humanity. He's done the work already. So France has not appeared yet in the tsunami campaign, but they know already. Eight days later, or something like a week later, he was the victim of a criminal entrapment operation in the French town where he lives. So he described it to me. Um, what happened is that he left a USB stick at a print shop. He called them in advance. So as we all know, the, the phone calls are monitored. And he said, he said, oh, I'm going to come and pick up the USB key. As he approached the shop in the car, um, he just turned into a, a, a little side street from, from a main street. There was a queue of cars. Um, and he stopped his car and one uh, there were two cars the first one was trying to get into a parking bay so that was going slowly so frederick stopped his car and then it was the stop and go situation so they were inching forward and at some point when this other guy, t guy finally um gave way the car in front of him should have accelerated but didn't and then frederick expected that the car's going to move but didn't so he kind of began to move and this happens to us all in every single parking lot of the supermarket every once in a while and then you realize oh my god the guy didn't move and then you slam on the brakes so that's what happened so the distance of car movement we're talking about is like half a meter to a meter from a standstill position frederick slams on the brakes and he says he can't remember if he, his car touched it, the other car or not. He said maybe he heard just the, the sound of plastic when the number plates are, you know, kind of touch, but there was no loud bang on nothing. So what he saw is the two people, there were two people, a woman on the passenger seat and the man, briefly look at each other, talk to each other for five seconds. Then the man got out of the car, went up to his car without even looking at the back of his car, so he couldn't give a damn about what happened to his car. And he started telling um, Frederick to put down his window and get out of the car in a very threatening manner. So Frederick, of course, didn't know what the hell is going on. And then after a while, the woman came out. She also didn't look at the back of the car. Um, and then they both started shouting at Frederick to get the hell out of the car. So Frederick was intimidated. He's been the victim of exactly the sort of street theater for two decades. So he thought, okay, I'm just gonna inch past these two people and I'm just gonna get out of the situation. There was a main road behind him. So the only way he could go is up on the pavement with his car and then kind of roll past them. So he rolled past him, the guy stepped to the side and he says the woman took a couple of steps back and then she jumped onto his car and held on to the sides of his window. And he showed me what car he has. The entire front of the car is like this. 
it's uh, hang on I have to look it up it's a uh, it's a uh, Honda Jazz 2009 make now Honda Jazz if you have a car accident and you just you know touch the front in an accident there's no way for you to hang on because it's like this but if you jump and she he says the woman literally held on to the sides the metal sides and was staring down into him as he was you know rolling his car how freakish you know and he says she had the skills of a stuntman well to me that sounds like an agent and then he says he rolled past and the, the street um kind of turned a bit and as he was turning the car she slipped off sideways okay so she was off the car and then he went home and he just escaped the situation there was nothing, no notification the next day. He has, I think, three missed calls from the French police who magically have his mobile phone number. He still doesn't know how the hell they could have left messages on his number, but they did. He didn't get them in time. The next day, they turn up in person with two police officers, two military police officers, and arrest him. And the police officers were surprised that the front of his car showed no damage whatsoever, not a scratch. Then they take him into the police station, and in the police station, they interrogate him, right? They claim that, there was, that he was reported because of this accident, a claim that since then has turned out not to be true. There's no trace of any sort of, you know, actual, um, what's it called, like police report about um, this accident, supposedly. And then the police officer said, yes, and the, the woman who was involved has horrific injuries. And here's her medical certificate. And he just held up a piece of paper that Philip, uh, sorry, Frederick wasn't allowed to read. And he was like, that's it. You know, medical certificate, boom, put aside. Frederick has no idea what he, he this guy could have been showing his mobile phone bill. You know, his daughter's mobile phone bill, as, as far as we you know, he didn't release the file. And he said, because of that, you were involved in a horrific accident. And they kept him overnight in the police station. And the police confiscated his car, so his car is now with the police. Okay, so that's kind of important because should the police want to put damage afterwards onto his car, they now can because the car is with them. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, well, when we looked at the, um, so I communicated with Frederick because what happened is that he stayed one night in the police station and the next day, so that the general practitioner who was at the police station decided that he is, um, you know, has got mental issues and they transferred him the next day to a psychiatric hospital within 24 hours. So after 48 hours, this guy was confined in a mental hospital where he's been since. Hmm. Now let's just take all the stop and go pseudo accidents that happen in France every single flaming day. And I ask how many people, when they bump into somebody, are in a psychiatric hospital 48 hours later? I mean, that is staggering. It's absolutely staggering. And then they claim, oh, she had horrific injuries. Where are the witnesses? Where's the blood? Where are the traces? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. But it gets better than that because then as soon as he arrived in the psychiatric ward, they immediately force medicated him with something that paralyzed his breathing for a day. So he says the first day he was walking around and he couldn't breathe. I mean, he kind of demonstrated what his breathing sounded like and it sounded like Darth Vader, you know? And he said that's because he couldn't breathe. And then they force medicated him with some sort of random bullshit, right? And then now he's been permanently medicated ever since he's been there, which is now a couple of weeks. So this entire thing happened at the beginning of May. And now it gets better than that because, um, so Frederick called me from the hospital. So he emailed me and then I spoke to him on the phone and I've been recording every conversation with him, you know, and it's documented, everything's documented. And um, he says this entire thing was an entrapment operation. And when I looked at the um, accident scene over Google Street View, I noticed that there was a CCTV camera right above the spot. Like, what are the flaming chances right above? There is no CCTV footage being shown by police of the accident or what the scene looked like before or after the accident. No trace of the CCTV camera. I'm not surprised because if this is an entrapment operation, you would use the CCTV camera to keep an eye and communicate with the agents. That's the most convenient way. I mean, you can put cameras everywhere, but if you've got a stationary CCTV from above, that's pretty good. Um, 
So none, the CCTV hasn't appeared anywhere. And it gets better than that because the um, psychiatric um, doctor he spoke to, um, a certain Madame Bigoshi, she's very interesting. Um, so she said to him that the only way he can leave the hospital ever is if he agrees for month to monthly injections of a drug every month for pretty much forever. Oh my God, this is so egregious. I cannot it's believe. so egregious, but it gets better than that. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter because these people are so flaming stupid. They don't understand in the 21st century, don't pull off shit like that. Because now I've got a list as long as my arm of corrupt officers. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable. So, and psychiatrists. And you know, psychiatrists. Yeah, this hospital needs to be sued. The police need to be sued and the psychiatrists need to be sued. The whole hospital needs to be sued. And that's exactly what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing. It gets better than that. Because, hmm? We should. Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to mount an offensive against these people. Because this is political psychiatry at its worst. I mean, this is exactly what they're pulling off everywhere, globally. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's called criminal. And that's exactly why it so wonderfully fits with me getting it black on white that the Swiss police is criminal in exactly the same way. What are the chances? You know, four times in a row they document that every single time I say microwave weapons, they go la 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 la. If I say, you know, break in, they go la la and break in. The police should be able to handle, you know, but it's wonderful. But what's really interesting is that um, Frederick says, according to a statement, the people who organized this setup are the mayor of Waron in France, um, the préfet uh, de, de l'Isère, that's um, also that's the Grenoble area. So the préfet of Grenoble has it now in for himself. The police officer who was acting most interestingly is a guy called Yannick Placiard, um, also in the Waron area. And, and the psychiatric um, doctor is um, Madame Bigoshi. Very interesting. It really, um, and I was just thinking, I mean, as I was listening to this, it was unbelievable, but get this, he can, there was um, a, a very quick judgment in which they decided that he's dangerous and he can't tell apart dangerous people or non-dangerous people because he mentioned the stalking and that's why he randomly attacks and apparently runs over people. So it's like, it's like these people are so flaming stupid, it's like, you know, every single time you deal with the intelligence agencies and these entrapment operations, I'm reminded of these little like picture stories I was given in primary school, you know, when you're age six and they give you like three or four pictures and it's like, now think of a story and you get these idiotic stories. Well, these entrapment operations and what the intelligence agencies and their morons spin together is like that, a primary school story. So it's, God, but get this. And there was already a judgment where it ju and by the way the, the judgment is something that has to be published and has to be read because it's beautiful the the judge said that uh, frederick claimed to be attacked with magnetic waves well the point is there are no magnetic waves they, they are only electromagnetic waves so this judge put in print that she has no freaking clue about basic physics that she should have learned in year eight at school no idea. So she most definitely has no idea about electromagnetic weapons. And it's very curious how, you know, police officers, when, when you complain about microwave weapons, instantaneously become like expert psychiatrists who can just pick up psychological changes, you know? Wow. So I was thinking that that's very interesting. And I said, Frederick, you have to appeal this judgment. And he did on the last day of the, um, um, of the, on the deadline. And he appealed the judgment last Friday. And guess what? We were talking Thursday after, uh, sorry, uh, he appealed on, on Friday, um, on the judgment. On Monday afternoon, we were talking, interrupted. He was called away. And when he came back, he said, guess what? They, um, the, the hearing for the appeal judgment will be tomorrow morning. And the problem is the hearing is scheduled for tomorrow morning at 11.30, but I have to apply 72 um, hours in advance if I want to leave the compound. So he is allowed to leave the compound if the police officer signs, the head of police, and if the you know psychiatric doctor signs a piece of paper and they need 72 hours for signature. So I said, Frederick, just apply, you know, I mean, you know, the hearing is set up such that within the rules, it's impossible for you to be at the hearing. So I said, um, Frederick, I'm, I'm telling you, just apply for this now. And if they don't, um, you know, give you this within 72 hours, we will say this is, you know, uh, perverting the course of justice, you know, that the system has to sort us out. 
So he applied. I also wrote a long document, you know, summarizing in, you know, for the joint investigation team that I analyzed this case and I talked to, um, you know, Frederick and what I can tell from the background of all the cases we know that to me it looks like a criminal entrapment operation, you know. And that was sent to the police officer, to his psychiatrist and also to the judge. He also gave us the judgment. So. Um, in that document, I explained that we see many cases and there's just staggering amount of evidence that what we're dealing with is intelligence agency corruption. So the judge read that and guess what? The judgment in the appeal was that he has to stay in the psychiatric hospital. So I said, okay, very good, Frederick, um, because now we can put, you know, we have picked up two judges who we can put, you know, crosshairs on. That's very good, metaphoric, administrative crosshairs, I mean. Um, and, um, you know, we, we will clear out this corruption, so let's go to the next level. So we were communicating about that. And then um, what was very interesting is that, um, so I wrote a, a letter um, explaining, you know, all this um, and saying that, in my view, this is, um, this is corruption. And then today he had a very interesting um, talk with, the, with his psychiatrist because she said, Okay, well, you know, um, well, the, the real issue here is that um, Frederic Laroche is to be, um, he's going to get married on the 10th of June. So his partner is coming and flying into France on the 10th of June. There's no one to pick him up at the moment. But then eventually, Frederic um, got, uh, you know, got leave to, for the one day to pick up his partner and take home. And he's allowed to stay one day with his partner. And, um, you know, the wedding is, I think, shortly after or, or that day or something. Um, so he's allowed to do that, but then he has to go back to the psychiatric hospital because he's so dangerous because oh he, you know, he bumped a car and stop and go. I mean, it's, it's absolutely breathtaking. Um, and then what was very interesting is that suddenly the psychiatrist again tried to blackmail him and said, well, you know, I mean, you can, you can leave. Um, if you agree to these monthly injections. And the monthly injections are such that you get one injection and the dose is so high that it lasts for a month. But people who have received these injections say that for the, the dose in the first three days is so high, you run around as if you were permanently drunk. Oh my God. So, yeah. And, and that you have to do. How can it be permitted? I mean, how can these psychiatrists get away with this? Be they are criminal, they are system unto themselves, and they are totally demented. They yeah. are psychopaths. And, and this is bullshit science. I mean, come on, a doctor who poisons, you know, a healthy man. I mean, first of all, I said in, in the um, documentation is that Frederick Laroche is perfectly healthy, right? So the psychiatrist can't detect a healthy person. What sort of bullshit science or medicine is that? And then the first act they do is poison him so that his breathing is paralyzed for a day. I mean, this is dangerous incompetence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Big or she and co have got it coming, really. I mean, this is, this is a criminal entrapment, the likes of which we haven't yes. seen. I think this case has to be dramatically publicized because this is absolutely evil. And it's it's, so, it just points out the extremity, the extreme evil of the situation. You know, yeah, and, and, they, and they talk about domestic terrorism, extremism. This is extremism. These yeah, psychiatrists exactly. are practicing extreme terrorism. Exactly. On the totally. totally, totally. We have criminals in psychiatry. Absolutely. And I bet my guts that they, there are some tentacles to the intelligence world because I said to Frederick, listen, um, the, the way you talk to me and the way you describe everything and, you know, the, the testimony you've given to me, um, I think you're perfectly healthy. So why would these guys want to entrap you and give you injections every month? Well, let's remember that what we're dealing with is also weapons testing. So they want to entrap people. And after he contacted, you know, the French parliament, they want to do weapons testing on him, these degenerates, you know? So I said, there's no way, there's absolutely no way that, you know, these monthly injections are even being discussed. You know, I mean, what the hell does it take? This guy has gone public already in 2015. And now, exactly a week after he contacts the French parliament, I'm like, no, 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 no. What we're going to do is we're going to contact the French parliament again, and we're going to say, oh, listen, what coincidence? And there's, there's like reams of coincidences. His insurance refused to pay, you know, and well, the police does, don't have an actual case. Uh, even the psychiatrist said when he was talking to Frederick at some point, she said, it's very interesting because the police doesn't really seem to, um, to know who the two people were in the car. 
There doesn't seem to be a case. There doesn't seem to be a claim. You know? So That's because the crisis actors, you know, they're just employed by them to run exactly. the entire scenario. You're, you're right. I mean, and Frederick LaRoche is right. It certainly sounds like an entrapment scheme beginning okay. to end. And, and there are these wonderful little nuggets, which are just circumstantial evidence. But when you've seen so many of these street theater things, well, what Frederick said that um, struck him in, in, in on the day was the guy who got out of the car was of a darker complexion. So maybe, you know, um, uh, Middle East or, you know, Morocco or, you know, Al Algeria, whatever. So darker completion. And he was in his very early th 30s. The woman who got out was in her maybe late 40s, 50s, and she was white and Caucasian, and she seemed to wear a wig, he said, because her hair was just unnaturally black and straight. Like, I can't count the number of times I've seen agents in, you know, just next to Pulach, where the BN BND is headquartered, wearing wigs around me. I've seen the same woman on one day three times with two different wigs, you know? So that's yeah. typically agent for me. And then he said the two didn't look like they were partners. So, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And the age gradient to me sounds like agent and handler, you know, totally. So, so now we're working to try to claw the CCTV out of the police, you know. But, I mean, also the thing, so this police officer, Yannick Plasia, because Frederick said he's a very honest guy. So when they arrested him, and handcuffed him and put him into the police car. Of course, he already talked to them in the police car, and he explained that he he has been for 19 years the victim of stalking and in, uh, street theater and this sort of stuff, and attacks with electromagnetic weapons. And then um, when he first discussed his case, you know, the police officer was neutral, and eventually when he said that he's being stalked, the police officer even said to him in the car, you know what, in the beginning, I felt sympathetic towards you. But now that you talk about stalking, I realize that you can't tell apart who is a dangerous person and who isn't, and you feel threatened by everybody. So it's like, you know, these police officers' educational standard are just like atrocious, you know? So, okay, but this sort of stuff just beggars belief, right? I mean, these sort of conclusions that these officers make, I mean, it's unbelievable. And so, I'm sorry. It's not just a conclusion. It's it's a protocol. It's a strategy. You know, yeah. it's like it's like um, what is it that they send around? This is company policy in police departments. Yeah. Apparently, you know, they mention <laughs> docking. They mention electromagnetic weapons. We're not going to say that we are using surveillance radar in the police station. We're not going to say we know everything about microwave weapons because we've helped rig up the entire city. You know, the and we are working closely with the telecom companies and the utilities to rig up the cell phone towers and the antennas and so forth. We're perfectly on top of all of this, but to the populace, we have our company policy, our police policy of saying, oh, these don't exist. What a joke. And you remember that, um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to bring this up. Remember that uh, little bit of info from uh, slavery.org that I sent you earlier, Catherine? It was about a case in the UK, and I forget, it was in the early 2000s, I think. It was somebody else, like La Roche, very similar case. It was brought to court. And during the lawsuit, the UK Home Office stepped forward. This was in the UK. The UK Home Office and said, uh, Home Office came forward and said they want no mention whatsoever of these weapons at all. They are not going to acknowledge them. You know, and that is the crux of the issue here. Yeah, we have a global governmental, and there's no other word for it, conspiracy. Yeah, and it's you know, you know what to keep the weapons hidden. Totally. It's a criminal conspiracy and criminal conspiracies are the staple of the courts, you know, and it's, it's bigger. It's, I think, a criminal business plan that's being run. And it's so yeah. interesting yeah. because we have the same modus operandum. And I think the word that the UK are using is standard operating procedure. This is their oh, yes. standard SOP. operating procedure. That's a military word. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and this is, so um, this is all, you know, um, so Frederick's case is, is swinging, but it, it's beautiful because it will tie in with um, everything that um, we're discussing. And sorry that I went on so much about this, but this is really important because it's now, it blew up in our face just right now. Um, and also there's, um, you know, uh, French elections and Frederick mentioned the elections are also relevant. So the timing is, you know, very relevant. But what we're going to do is we're going to contact the French parliament again. And um, we now have a list so they don't realize, but by, by doing this, you know, this corruption ballet, 
they are generating lists about themselves, you know, the list of, of corrupt people. And, um, and the préfet of Grenoble seems to be involved. And I've been to Grenoble, and that place is, is scattered with Masonic signs to the hilt. So just based on that, I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, uh, well, the pedophile architecture is just as, you know, vibrant and uh, alive and well there as it elsewhere. And when you have this staggering corruption, the question is always, how can the mayor of Warren police officers and the préfet of Grenoble and judges be corrupted. And typically there's only one answer, you know, it could be money, but you need something a bit, bit more when it's like that. But anyway, so, you know, the people, the, uh, the administration of Grenoble managed to generate um, files on themselves literally within just a few weeks, which is beautiful. But anyway, so we will, we will continue doing that. So that's it from me. And now we should launch into the total bombshell case that has tentacles into absolutely everything, which is the case of, of Dr. Millicent Black. Yes. Hey, Millicent, can you just move your camera a little bit? Because we're not seeing your whole face. At least I'm not. Is that better? Um, yeah, that's good. Tilt it down a little bit. Yeah. There we go. I think I can see you now. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. So, Millicent, I mean, I guess if people are watching my website, I've been working on adding links to the article, which came out last week, and I'm still working on it. I was doing it just before this started. But Catherine, I think what you've talked about regarding La Roche kind of segues in naturally to one aspect, in fact, a very large aspect of Millicent's case, and that's the issue of psychiatry. And so why don't we just jump in through that uh, you know, doorway because psychiatry is such a huge aspect of this entire cover-up, establishment cover-up. Um, and so Millicent, I think, experienced something very similar, right? And she actually got, we talked about this a little bit last time, I think, she actually got some confirmation from a police officer about the standard operating procedure. Right, Millicent, did you want to talk about that? That's right. Uh, it was Sergeant Jeffrey Taylor who came to my home and, and because I was already knowledgeable about the electronic harassment uh, technologies, he said, well, you know, we have a spiel that we're supposed to give to people who call us, but since you are already knowledgeable, we, I'll just bypass that and talk to you with intelligence. And he did indeed then go on to say some other things about the fact that you're chipped when you're taken to the hospital uh, if in an accident, and that could be very well the reason for so many staged traffic accidents is to get people that there for those purposes. Also, covert, I, chipping. covert chipping against people's wills. Thank you, Karen. Yes. yes. Also, I wanted to uh, remind people about the 1997 bill that uh, then Senator John Glenn introduced to Congress. It was called the Human Research Protection Act. And that act in itself says, in fact, his opening statement to Congress was, Madam Chairman, uh, what would you say if I were to tell you that every time your wife, your husband, your family member went to a doctor or to the hospital that they may come away with something having been put in them that may do them harm and it may not. He went on to explain that he, as a pilot, well, actually as an astronaut, had agreed to such, but he never said chipping, he never said implantation, but the illusion was that that's exactly to what he was talking about or was referring. So between he and Ohio Representative Dennis Kucinich, mm -hmm. who also approached Congress with what was called the Space Preservation Act, uh, the two of them were actually blowing the whistle on the fact that people were being set up to be harassed from space mm -hmm. through illegal and un, uh, cons not consented implantation. Oh, wow. Yeah. I actually just and very maybe. briefly. Just very briefly, Millicent, can you turn your screen even further down? Because when you when you um, speak, it cuts it off, and I can just see this much. Just turn it even much further down than you would actually, you know. Because I think you see a different format than we do. So even further down, because um, we can just see the top of your head. Just to throw this piece of information in there, of course, everybody knows John Glenn is a 33rd degree Mason. Oh, really? 
<laughs> of course. All the astronaut all the astronauts are. Oh my Is god. That I think that's perfect. Yes, yes. But you know what you said about the um this entire this the space architecture. I, you know, for people who find this unbelievable and they say, oh, you know, space satellites or oh, now you're going off into sci-fi. I always say that, you know, um, just think about what we're doing now. I mean, I can send, um, you know, a picture just over the mobile phone. It's just using the chip and it does all this processing and we're using the satellites just to send images, voice, everything, text, anything. So the, the architecture is already there. And when people doubt that um, body chips can be um, you know, controlled by a satellite and they say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory and that's mad, I always just say, well, you know what? If it were the 1980s and someone would tell you, oh, you know, there's this satellite infrastructure um, that allows me to you know, send you these images, they would say, oh, nonsense. You know, are you telling me that you know, uh, someone would put satellites into space just so, you're, so you can photograph your food and sell it, say to, you know, send it to your parents you know, somewhere across the globe? That's exactly what people do. You know? And, and this chipping, uh, the, the architecture to read out the chips, the satellite systems, was already in place and fully operational decades before we even knew. You know? That's something to keep in mind. But that's a bombshell that they actually said that to you, Melissa. Yes. It's important to, to understand that both John Glenn and Dennis Kucinich were from the state of Ohio, where a major human research, um, human effects research laboratory is associated with the Air Force, and that is Wright Patterson Air Force Base. So they were essentially, you know, actually whistleblowing based on their own experiences and their knowledge of what was coming to humanity. The other thing about the um, the Space Preservation Act is within the body of the act. Dennis Kucinich actually did use the words uh, exotic weapons and mind control. Now, I'm not sure of the year of the publication, but there was also an article, and it is extremely explicit, that's been put into print by a man named John Fleming. The title of that article is The Shocking Menace of Satellite Sur Surveillance. And in the body of that article, he actually describes the many ways that a person can be assaulted from space, including being made to fall out of the bed, to be made to uh, what they call forced speech, to say something. Uh, they could be made to walk in their sleep. They could also, if you were in a conversation with someone, the person that's having the conversation with you could be made to say something that would offend you. And you would think they were doing it just out of their own obnox obnoxious behavior when actually they were being uh, remotely controlled to do that. And that kind of was putting together the formation of the organized stalking piece uh, such, in such a covert way. People cannot tell when they're being manipulated. In fact, there's a very good article out now that's entitled, Is Your Thoughts Your Own? Mm -hmm. Because essentially none of us now can actually tell when our thoughts are our own. We all know we have the best intentions. We know our own personalities. We know that we would not intentionally hurt anyone or harm anyone or say anything that would offend anyone. However, I think we may have all been in those positions where that has happened. It certainly comes to play from psychiatry or, or the behavioral uh, standpoint, Catherine, when you deal with, with husbands and wives and with, you know, with family members, and that's one of the biggest plays of the um, remote behavior influence technology is that ability to cause and to create difficulty within a family unit. Mm -hmm. And all of that, there are so many technologies, as you say, Melissa, and I think what you're talking about right now, I mean, there's ways in which they are, this is thought injection and impulse injection and image injection, you know, using transmission frequencies at the on the same range or the same continuum as the brain transmits at and they transmit at a very low rate between zero to 30 hertz so in a sense all this has been mapped out by our military and intelligence agency complex it's been mapped out it's been in place and it's been in operation as everyone who's targeted uh, neurologically can attest to as, as millicent is attesting to and you know, now, if you actually look at the, the world of um, neurology, brain science, neuroscience, and the world of neurocriminology, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of disclosure.
But of course, it's not being talked about as non-consensual human experimentation, which is what we've experienced, right? It's being talked about more in the sense of public domain, neuroscience making great discoveries, and so forth and so on. But really, you know, transcranial magnetic stimulation, deep brain stimulation, EEG heterodyning, taking somebody's brain waves when they're in a moment of anger, and then injecting it back to them when they're in a moment of calm to revivify that state of anger or into somebody else's brain to, you know, transmit yeah. that moment and called EEG cloning, cloning emotions from one person to another. All this stuff is going on, and it's been going on apparently for decades in the military and intelligence world, and it's so under wraps. And, you know, oh, you, you'll find this really amusing. May, I think the first week of May 2017, signfiller.com. If you look on the internet, just type in, just Google hacking human brains. Just Google that and you will see signfiller.com saying, oh, DARPA is announcing that they're really interested now in hacking the human brain, reverse engineering the human brain, all very kosher in public domain and, you know, open conversation um, because they would really like to help people learn new languages, you know, just download those languages, um, help you. DARPA wants to help you. So that's the way in which it's being couched now. Absolute joke. I looked at those articles this morning because I was looking for one particular article, Millicent. You know which one, right? Hacking the human brain, the Air Force, um, the next domain of um, warfare, I think from wire.com. I was looking for the link for that, and I came upon this treasure trove of DARPA's new attacks, new um, you know, information for the world, that they're really on your side, they want to help us all. You want to learn Latin or Italian, go to DARPA. They'll ship you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, actually, the whole decade of 1990 was called the decade of the brain. Now, do you think that was in a haphazard manner? You know, 1990 started 27 years ago. 1990 is when I can say I first woke up with some thoughts in my mind that were not my own. I, I was not familiar with the song that was being that had been sent to me mm -hmm. by uh, Sublimia Messaging, mm -hmm. and it was in, indeed January twentieth, nineteen ninety. Yes, I thought that that particular thing that you spoke about, Millicent, which I wrote about in the article, was particularly interesting. That way back in the nineties, you woke up one morning with the words of a specific song. And the way in which you describe it, I think you said it was more sort of subliminal messaging. It wasn't a real voice. Was it a real voice? What was it? No, it, it was it was subliminal. The words were already there. Uh, I understand that in post hypnotic suggestions, and, and we've all seen that done on on the television. You know, there was a commercial where this man would walk up to some someone on the street in New York, and he say, "Could I could I hypnotize you?" And and they would say yes, and so he would give them some suggestion. While they were asleep, he would obviously put them to sleep. And then he would say, when you awaken, you're going to do this. And they would wake up and do exactly that and not know that that's what mm -hmm. happened to them. And that's what I learned was probably what had happened at that point. I woke up with the words to the song going on in my head. And that was not a familiar song, not a song that I had sang. However, uh, this was 1990. So 24 year, 23 years later, I see the words of that song in the article. As having been written by someone who was familiar to me, and that someone so uh, had also had a, a a long Air Force career. Yes, and Mr. Wolf, who is your chief persecutor, yeah, whose name we are um, protecting, not for his sake, but um, for the sake of your litigation against him. Yeah. Exactly. But going now, what back are to the plans? Go ahead, Melissa. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, you go ahead. My, one of the plans was when we initiated this particular broadcast was to do Millicent Black from beginning all the way through because the comment was made that we had done it haphazardly. We had gone into this atrocity that happened to her in that one, but chronological sequence is what we kind of wanted to do today. So would you still like to do that, gang? Yeah. That's fair. Absolutely. And I think um, Karen had the idea of just going through the article and just looking at the, the, the outline and just going through it, right? And just talk about exactly what happened to Millicent. And, right, right. right. And her, 
her case is um, it encompasses so very much of the abuse that people are experiencing, but it's <laughs> but she has so very much of it. I mean, not everybody has all of this. And one of the unique things that is especially frightening is not only can the establishment do this to someone, but in her case, some nitwit who got training in the establishment and left is now doing it to her, his, you know, her own private stalker. And he has basically gotten permission from those people who essentially threw him out for not being fit you know, for the, for their uh, purposes. Now he's off doing it on his own and destroying someone and he's gotten the establishment's attention and they're saying, oh, well, that's interesting. We'll pay you for us to watch you destroy this woman's body. So he's freelancing and they're allowing it. So um, like I said, this puts a personal stalker on a whole horrific new level. You know, just because he gets the training and then somehow he gets the equipment and then because he's had an in, he gets the establishment to give him a contract to to stalk, harass and physically destroy Millicent for his own um, pleasure and profit. And then the establishment gets the information he gives them on what he's doing, how and uh, what uh, is being done to Millicent and how she's suffering. So this is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's hard to imagine something more egregious than the entire program, but this is uh, one of those cases that even goes beyond the pale of the uh, egregiousness of this program. So yeah, we need to start out with um, how she met him, who he was, the training that he got, and why and how he decided to make a lifetime of targeting and destroying Millicent, her family, and the people of the town that he not only has convinced to go along with it, but he picks them off, you know, every so often by saying, oh, I think this person might tell on me. So I just gave him or her a heart attack or a stroke or something. And also, again, going back to what uh, Catherine was talking about, the complicity, the utter and complete complicity of the local police, the local authorities, the FBI in Tennessee, and anyone, everyone that we have contacted on her behalf, whose duty it is to protect the American people, which is the only reason the government exists, is for truly the protection of the citizens of a country, of a state, of a county. That is their primary reason to exist. And yet this is the one thing that they will not do anymore. So I'll be quiet and let Millicent just go into her story from the start. Mm -hmm. So actually, sorry, just briefly, the one question I had is, you know, this was very interesting because the the thought, sorry, the um, subliminal injection of this song, was that really early on? Was that even before you got aware? At what point was that in the beginning of your targeting? Absolutely. That was um, 1990, which at that point, I did not know I was being stalked or targeted. Um, let me clarify also, the term target is what the United States military calls an opponent, an enemy. Mm -hmm. So lots of people have different uh, opinions or ideas about someone being called a target, but that's exactly what it is. If you were to go to any of the, the uh, Department of Defense manuals and, and type in the word target, you're going to find that target becomes their enemy or their opponent. Um, so for all intensive purposes, 1990 was the, was the year that I can prove that I was receiving technology into my brain that was owned and patented to the Department of Defense. Wow, Actually, um, just very briefly because, um, sorry, I don't mean to hackle you or anything, but because um, we have all these different videos at the bottom, I can now kind of see your face, but it's because of the video inlays. We really just see your eyes. And if you just turn it even further down so that I can see more of your face, because I think the way it appears. Is, is it better this way? Now I can barely see anything. So you have to turn the camera downwards so that we can see your entire face. And the reason why I kind of, that is perfect. That even further, because kind of slips up slips upwards exactly so now this is perfect and the reason why i wanted to um see you like that is because a lot of um you know you are giving um your testimony and a lot of it 
when you see somebody's face, you instantaneously know that they're saying the truth. You know, so it's so important that we see your entire face because it's just clear to anybody, clear as day, that this is all true, you know. That's amazing. Sorry, continue. You know, I wanted to say, if you wanted to go through the, the story of Millicent sort of step by step, what we could use as a guideline is the article because that's pretty much what I did. Um, after speaking with her extensively, I tried to set up a chronology, sequential, based on, you know, her story and her recollections. Going all the way back to the 80s, right, Millicent, the early 80s, when she met this guy, I suspect just shortly before he went into the Air Force. And then um, when he came back six years later, 92, uh, 88, um, I gather he wanted to pick up the relationship again, but she did not. And, and therefore, because she did not, there was a lot of hostility from him. So, Millicent, did you want to talk about that? And the other thing is, you know, during that time period that he was away, one of the things that Millicent later learned through her extensive research and her doing four years and so forth is that uh, what he did in the Air Force during that time period possibly was um, spear torture training. He had gone to, um, he was at an Air Force base, I think, was it Fairchild Air Force Base or Washington State, where he learned um, survival training, which is something that's given to all Air Force people. And that's survival evasion resistance escape training, and it's supposed to harden um, soldiers. Um, so in case of capture, they will uh, stop at revealing any kind of um, supposed um, national security information. So, and it also involves enhanced interrogation techniques. Literally, they're put through various kinds of tortures, sleep deprivation, sensory deprivation, and extremes of hot, heat and cold, things like that. Um, beatings, you name it. Um, so and so he he literally learned a great deal from that training, which he later, in many years later, was to tell Millicent that he wanted to use on her. But Millicent, if you wanted to start from there, you know, from the time that you met this guy and then he went off to the Air Force and so forth, that might help. Well, you know, Ramola, I am deliberately not saying everything because I'm still seeking a permanent order of protection. And sure. for me to say too much that would actually point to him uh, could be used against me by his lawyer. So I'm okay. trying to be very aware of what I say, because in, in most of my co communication with the police department and surely at least once a month, I am reminding them that I am indeed a victim of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And my certified male correspondents, I say to them specifically, I still want and mm -hmm. in fact, it was once I specified that I still want an order of protection, and this was over well right at a year ago now, that was when the the investigations stopped. Mm -hmm. So, there, so if that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. You know what we can do is simply refer readers to the article because it has all the information. You know, it has the chronology. So if you don't, yeah, as far as the personal story goes, it is in there, and you know, and I know that uh, before we embarked on this article, which really people should know has been a very long procedure and involved a great deal of back and forthing and interviews and conversations and examination of documents and so forth. Um, we ascertained for both of ourselves that you were at a point, you were ready to publicize the story because this story is a very powerful story. And what makes it especially powerful, Millicent, is the fact that you have incredible evidence to support your story, right? That's and to correct. support to support the account of your experience. And, and that, in a great deal, is what the article um, stresses on as well. And I'm yet to go in and put the graphics in, for instance, the graphics from your sleep studies that you said was okay to use, which I will do this week, Thanks. you know. Um, yeah, and also I think you had told me the the um, the body area network with with the implants marked, right, from a private investigator. That particular right. graphic, those two graphics, I think, are extremely telling, exactly. and would add a great deal of heft to the article. Exactly. So, so yes, I'll can I'll do that. I'll add those in. I, I would, um, but perhaps we can talk about that. Go ahead. Yeah, I would just wanted to say I'm just going to share my screen. I brought up the article for um, people to see. So please go to everydayconcerned.net 
and that's um, Ramola D's site. And then here at the top, you'll see electronic slavery in America, military neural weaponry use contract free by US Air Force veteran to abuse exemplary and highly accomplished Tennessee woman pastor and, con and to control the town. So if you click on this, you'll see the entire article. And at the top, you will see all the content links, which will be, you know, the actual introduction um, to, to what we're going to discuss now. And if you just scroll through this, you will see just how much there is. I mean, you know, remote brain interference, implantation, you know, radio waves, radio stations and radio hypnosis. It's absolutely incredible. So I urge everybody to open this in the background as they are um, listening to us. Um, and actually just, um, you know, follow it through because the first time you hear Millicent's story, it blows your mind and it's very, very hard to take it all in. So have this open as a, as a bookmark. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, that's why I'm, that's why I'm kind of mo mo monitoring or, or kind of modulating what I say and how I say it. So if I go back to 1990, which is the year that I documented in my journal, that I had woke up with, with words going on in my brain that were not familiar to me. Then, and, and then even if I came forward uh, be, beyond or aside from, because it still would tie back to 1981 when I began this, what I thought was going to be a platonic relationship with someone by phone um, that actually turned into me, actually what seemed to be my children and me becoming practice for that person who was on his way to get military training. Um, so, and, and, and then tie it in with the articles as well that, that confirm that what was happening to me was actually, at, even at that point, remote behavior influenced technology. Um, because I didn't get the words to that song just one time. Uh, I, I was awakened at specific times to hear, hear this song being sung. Uh, I was called to, a, drawn to a, a, a television station that I didn't normally turn to on a Saturday evening to hear the song being sung. Even those were instances of, of behavior influence that I did not realize was happening to me at that time. Uh, I can come on forward to, um, and, and I, I will, to 1996, when um, a cousin told me, we've been told we can blame anything on you. Mm -hmm. They were already getting, had already gotten word of remote behavior influence technology being used on me. Mm -hmm. uh, 1997, uh, another cousin said to me, Millicent, the devil is playing with your mind. And when they get through playing with you, they're going to destroy you. He is going to destroy you. He is going to destroy you, is what she said. Then she said, and when they open your body after you're dead, they will find out that all of your organs have been stressed. These are important statements to me, even if I were to go back to 1982 or between 1982 and 1988. But what will tie all of that in is what is happening to me is indeed seer torture tactics. Um, because of the ability of the, of the Air Force Research Laboratory to actually pinpoint a place on a, a person's body and direct the energy to that spot, to do damage. There are multiple uh, publications on the internet that the Air Force Research Laboratory and the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Directorate have, um, have published that show the impact of, of a, an object, of, of military uh, launched object to the body or to an organ specifically. So, what is happening to me, what has driven me to the place of needing a neurologist, an, a, an orthopedic doctor, an endocrinologist, a cardiologist, uh, an, an audiologist, oh, a pulmonary specialist, and a sleep study doctor, is the fact that according to the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Human Effects and the articles that we have, written, have, have read about space-based weapons is that I am being victimized by them. I believe, have every reason to believe that the person that has victimized me with space-based weapons has been trained to use them, not just through seer torture tactics, but also as part of counterintelligence counter or counterterrorism and the war on terror. So essentially, I have a personal terrorist. Um, during my doctoral dissertation, I, I did indeed run across 
uh, the use of that term in personal relationships and it's called um well intimate partner terrorism simulated controlled warfare exactly exactly and, and a simulated controlled warfare was one of the statements that my cousin said to me in 1997 1997 so here we are 2017 20 years later and, and, and my body tells the story that what was spoken to me in 1997 is true. The constant harassment, the constant uh, examination, the constant subtle interrogation confirms what my cousin said to me in, in, in 1996. They're constantly seeking to blame something on me. And the, the, the wherewithal of being able to do that is the fact that I can, can be and have been being without my permission and without my, my informed consent, remote behaviorally influenced. Among I other things. In, in, hmm? Among other things. Exactly. Well, it, it's, it's both behavioral, both physical and psychological. And the two go together. And once they're put together, they're called trauma-based mind control. The trauma is what's used to actually cause that person to dissociate a, of, of a uh, sort of. Um, and the mind control is, is, is designed to cause you to be more easily manipulated while you're in a state of pain. So 2008, we've gone from 1990 to 1996, 1997. Well, actually, I, I, I can actually go back, go on then to 1999, when I received a phone call from someone inviting me to dinner. That, that person gave parameters by which I would uh, be with him. And I gave my own parameters by which I would agree. Um, I worked in Nashville, and so it was easy to, to accept that invitation, which was to dinner in Nashville, you understand. What I did not know is that that was also a setup, and that setup was for, for him to be able to further victimize me um, via space-based space -based weapons. The, um, the results of that, of that dinner and, and that, that involvement that at that time, I was not to learn for nine more years. And that was when he came back and said, that night I loaded your body with microchips. And then I was ready to start you on a round of surgeries. That round of surgeries commenced. Now this was July, 1999, um, that I had that encounter. And, and by May, 2000, I was in surgery. And the surgery was for uh, pain in my body that I could not explain and nothing would cause it to go away uh, except for the joint removal and, and that's significant joint removals because the joints are, are um, there is research through the Air Force Research Laboratory and through human effects that show the, the specific um, damage that can be done to joints from various impacts. So that was my little toes. Both little toes were removed, joints. The, the middle joint was removed from both little toes in 2000. In 2001, I had a work-related injury that was my shoulder. It was a rotator tear. Um, the interesting thing about that is that my shoulder was cut open. And so there's like a, a four to six inch scar on my shoulder. But it was from pain that you know, could not be controlled. Now, I, I obviously, during the course of my work, I was put in positions that um, put me at risk for the injury. And it was a repetitive stress injury. Um, but that also led me to surgery. So even if you just count up the surgeries, you'll find that I've had, there have been multiple opportunities for me to be implanted without my permission. And if you were to look at the, uh, at the nuclear bone scan that was ordered by an orthopedic doctor in 2014, you will see that in all of the sites of those surgeries and some, there are visible, what they call chronic inflammation, but the inflammation is generally uh, produced as a result of microwave heating via implantation.
I just very briefly, just, just one moment, because already, like what you told us in this brief summary is staggering. So I just would like to spell it out for all the people for whom it's, you know, maybe too much to actually comprehend what she's telling us. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things you just said because they are bombshells. Every sentence you just said is like a headline that should have run in the New York Times for weeks on end, right? So what we have here, right, let's spell it out, is we have your family members already or, you know, relatives knowing about what's being done to you from the beginning and talking to you about it and hinting at it. You also have um, already in 1990, you said they were already trying to put and managed to put, you know, radio um, transmissions and, and um, you know, radio songs into your head, which you then heard on the radio over and over. And by the way, I, I've experienced this that, you know, they would, um, I would hear the same radio song over and over on the real radio. But um, the way I can tell is what they do is they have some little broadcasting station nearby and the signal is so strong it overrides the radio or they broadcast on the same signal. So they, or they manipulate the radio. So, you know, when you go to a radio station, they control what you hear, you know, if you're, if you're being targeted. But that is staggering. So what we have here is, um, is the corruption of a community and of a family whereby your own family members know that you will be tortured to death or yeah. tortured for years on end and they do not say anything. Yeah. And they even gloat to you about it. I mean, that is staggering. And then the other thing is that every single time you went to surgery, you were, now we can prove you were loaded with chips. You know, and later on, an FBI agent will tell you that is such a standard operating procedure that he knew that when people go to surgery or they have a car accident, they are loaded with chips. So this means, and these are Nazi experiments, okay? Mm -hmm. So I want people to understand the Nazis tattooed a serial number onto your body. So when you have a chip shot into you, you know, or placed into you with a serial number, it's, it's what the Nazis did. Okay, so that's something to take in. That in itself is a headline for the New York Times, which the New York Times doesn't run because they're so corrupt. But, you know, be aware that this is a wowdy bombshell, you know. So people are standard by a standard operating procedure loaded with chips. They are being put through the Nazi procedure and it's now so widely known that it's, you know. And then once you have these chips in your body, you can be crippled with pain and you can be induced to have joints removed. I mean, take that in. It's, it's absolutely mind-boggling. And then these chips can be used to induce horrific pain and destroy your joints. And that's exactly what all the victims experience. And that's also what I experience. And what Millicent said is that these weapons can be used to hone in on a very specific part of your body. I can attest to that. You know, I can totally, all of us can attest to that because with me, they shot specifically into joints they made feet swell up and all this stuff. So everything she's saying is true. Take that in, people. You know, take that in. Mm -hmm. And if you want to look at the article, the the, the portions where the, uh, Millicent, uh, where the story is covered, this aspect of the story is covered, is COVID implantation, brain interference, radio hypnosis, and post hypnotic suggestion. That's one. And then COVID implantation in American hospitals. I think it's very important to point out this is mm -hmm. happening in America. It's happening in Europe, it's happening in Asia, in India, in Australia, in New Zealand, because at this point in time, we're all part of this global conglomerate run by criminals, the criminal cartel at the top, who's running this program around the world, you know, implanting people, experimenting on people, targeting people, all of this, and of course, running this whole collusion with psychiatry as well. So this COVID implantation in American hospital subsection really talks about all of um, Millicent's surgeries. And um, in fact, Millicent, there's one aspect of one of the surgeries which I think might be um, very interesting to relate because um, of the significance it has regarding what happens really at surgeries when people, when Americans, thinking that the medical system is working on their behalf for them, you know, go into a hospital and they submit themselves to maybe an overnight stay or an operation 
where they go under. They give an anesthetic and they go under. What happens then? And I think when you did your right shoulder surgery, was it um, there was an anesthetist who came into the room and his You're name right. tag, yeah, okay, and his name tag said something different from what he said his name was. So if you wanted to talk about that, that I think is so essential. That was the right hand surgery. Let me just make one correction uh, of something that Catherine was saying. It was not an FBI agent at that point. It was a, it was a sergeant who told me that when you go into to surgeries that they implant you. But he had um, worked with the CIA, correct? He that's said correct. He worked with the CIA on the LSD experiments during the Vietnam War. Exactly, exactly. Um, that was right hand surgery. And that was actually 1995. So you see, my joints were already being worked on and I did not know it because I don't know anyone else who has ever had their thumb joints removed but me. I don't know anyone else. So obviously the, th the thumb joints were easy to get to for the person that was directing energy to me. And uh, the thumb joint that was removed in 1995 does indeed show something in it on the, on the nuclear bone scan that was done at a, at a hospital in Dayton, Ohio. Um, the person who came into the room that, that day, he had on a white jacket. He was said, introduced himself as, as uh, Dr. Michael Sutton. He said that he had, uh, he was the anesthesiologist. But what I did notice was that that was not the name on, his, on the jacket. And the place where I was, though it was a hospital uh, same day surgery facility. It was like in the basement. It was dark and kind of eerie. Um, I've spoken with someone else who actually is an ex, um, well, a what a former Air Force. I was told not to say ex. A former Air Force um, sergeant, female, who told me that something like that happened to her as well. And that's been in the last few years that she went in for surgery and and when they were taking her to the operating room, she said it was way, way, way away, way too far to be to a normal mm. operating room. And after that, she also found some things that were unusual to her body that another doctor had pointed out. But in, anyway, for my surgery in, in this particular period of time, December 1995, he did indeed introduce himself as Dr. Michael Sutton. And yet the name on the jacket said something different. When I looked for Dr. Michael Sutton, the only person I could find was someone in the Oak Ridge Laboratory vicinity that was in Upper uh, West Tennessee near Knoxville. And again, my the nuclear bone scan does indeed show something in this part of my hand uh, where that surgery was done. But you have to wonder, at least I surely wonder, was energy directed to that part of my body? Um, what is happening to me right now is, is my, my tablet is getting low on energy, which is, is being drained quickly because I surely had enough to have gone through oh much my. longer than we've been talking. Um, last week when it started to happen, it would not take a charge either. And so I had to just get off the call altogether. It is, it says that it is charging. However, it's going to make it a lot more difficult for me to give, uh, you know, to talk in a, I guess, without the stress of having to hold the tablet and, and all of that to keep it down low enough for y'all to see me. Now, is this, is this positioning low enough for you to see me? That's good. Um, a, a bit more. I would say you have to hold it further down than you would. Extend. I think that's perfect. I think that's perfect. Yeah. Well, what this does having to hold it like this just stresses me and makes it a lot more difficult to concentrate. Um, but obviously that's the plan. So, and, and so, but this is, these are the things that I think are, are so important while we talk about my story or even while they read my stories to know how I came to have so many surgeries or how the joints were involved in it. I will definitely send to Mindy some of the um, Air Force Research Laboratory and the Joint Non-Lethal Weapon Director's PDF files to add to this uh, podcast so that people can read and see that damages to our organs even is planned. 
it's not just something that happened as a result of us being shot by directed energy weapons or using cell phones or having Wi-Fi in our homes. 1997, I was told specifically my organs would be stressed. And, and stress is exactly what happens to an organ that it encounters directed energy weapon, be it microwave or gamma waves or x-rays uh, or ultrasound. Stress is exactly what it does to the organs. Um, so we went from, from my toes, my toe joints being removed to, this, to the right shoulder, which again involved a joint, to the left thumb joint being removed, which was, so the shoulder and the thumb, left thumb were done in 2001. And then 2002, I ended up having both knee joints removed. And that's what I'm having the most difficulty with right now is my right knee. Uh, from the a body scan that was done by a private investigator that, that uh, Ramola will put up as a link to the article, you will be able to see that around my right knee joint are six implants just around the knee itself. And it's the center of the knee that is has been uh, destroyed, not just the, the implant itself, but also the spacer that, that allowed me to have equal height. So now I really do walk with a, a deeper limp. One of the things that I found out in 2003, as after a cousin of mine who told me, Millicent and I work in research, so get on the internet and see what they're doing to you. That was just kind of a, a, a bigger suggestion that something else was happening to me. Uh, I found an article that told about the cruelty of trauma-based mind control, not realizing that that's really what was happening to me. But I showed it to, to someone really close to me, and she gasped as she read it, and she said, this is so cruel. I could tell at that point they didn't tell her, or that Barrett Wolf, because he seemed to have been the one to, alerting people of what was happening to me. And so apparently Barrett Wolf didn't tell her what exactly was going to be done, how cruel and inhumane it would be done, and the results of it. And when that person saw me with the walker in 2015, she snatched and she said, do you have to use that? Because again, she's now having to deny that she's been participating and not participating, but she's been forced into silence and for fear of herself and her sister and even her own child, she's having to keep quiet while she watches these horrible things be done to her mother. Now the, the intent, the, the, the absolute intent of me being made a spectacle, not just to this community, not just to this state, but also to this nation is what I understand the fact that people can go to a computer and that there's a website that they're told to go to where they can actually look at the damage that's being done to my body. In 2012, I was being sexually assaulted while in my bed. And Barry Wolf's V2K said to me, Millicent, call the police department. Tell them to go to the computer and see what I've just done to you. When I called the police department and the sergeant came to my house, he said, did he tell you what website to go to? There is so much uh, evidence that I actually have been set up to be a national spectacle. But why? Is there a war against one woman? If so, why? If there's been a crime committed, why have I not been given the same um, due process as anyone else? If there's not a crime being committed, when is it gonna, what is it gonna take for the Department of Defense, the United States, House of Representatives, the United States Senate, the president even, or the vice president, to realize that they're playing into the whims of one man's fantasy of a personal vendetta against one woman. And it's not just against one woman, it's against that woman's children and that woman's family. I've had multiple family members that have been murdered. And I believe murdered because I've also found the technology that allows them to be murdered from, from space as well as beaten. What is the problem? What is the reason? Why are your tax dollars and my tax dollars being used to further one man's fantasy? The nation or showing the community or showing his family that he can torture someone to death and get away with it. 
Yes, Millicent, and also I think it has to be stressed that what Barrett Wolf is doing, as Karen pointed out earlier, I think when we were prefacing this, he's actually acting for larger groups, the larger organizations. He's acting for universities. He's acting for the Department of Defense. He's acting for the Air, US Air Force. He's acting for whoever has got a contract out, engaging in human experimentation non-consensually on your body. He's acting for whoever is taking those readings from those um, waveguides that have been formed in your body, right? Through um, your private investigators' investigations and radio scans, you the troposphere exactly right. data frequencies and so forth. We have to indict them all. We have to name the criminals. Barrett Wolf is actually not a lone wolf. He is being set up to be the lone wolf so that every one of us focuses in on him. And even then, it's V2K at this point. You see? So he's hiding safely in his little ivory tower, his mansion, which is not very far from where you live. That's right. And, and simply hitting you with energies and V2K and constant energies to implant activate your entire body so that you're in a, a situation of continuous fear torture, you know? And he's doing this remotely. All of this is being done remotely. He's like the button pusher. And behind him is a whole conglomerate of criminal agencies who need to be indicted and prosecuted and thrown in jail. I, I think also, we, sorry. Those agencies have been identified four agencies, four branches of the Department of Defense. Again, please keep in mind, these are our tax dollars at work. That's the, the, uh, the Air Force, the, the Army, the Marines, and the Navy. Then there are three, uh, uh, three major universities, of which my former employer is one of them. There are, are at least five military contractors, which include Lockheed Martin. And then there's a whole system of schools. Would you please tell me what, te what, what teacher can explain to a child in the kindergarten or in the sixth grade, or even, in, even as a senior, how a tax dollar can be used to torture a woman, a female body, and that child be allowed to watch it. So what are we doing with the mind of that, of that child? while they are, or if they're using me for some military university um, um, soldier to get his master's degree or his PhD, how can he determine in his own conscious that he knows there's a woman in, in America who is being mistreated in this way and I'm using her data to, to, to substantiate my dissertation, then, then who are we turning out? What are we turning out in terms of people with conscience, people with morals, people with integrity? And yet all they have to do is keep quiet and get the degree. Well, we're, we're basically creating a whole society of sociopaths and we are creating a society that is the opposite of what the American uh, basically uh, experiment was all about and that's the rights of the individual we are teaching people to worship the government as the only entity that tells you right and wrong and that is so un-american and that's the danger we are turning into a civilization that is not worth saving i have it you know i have trouble praying for my country because i look around and it looks like sodom and gomorrah to me and i remember that uh Billy Graham's wife said, if God does not judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. No ifs, ands, or buts, period. So I basically end up praying for the remnant, for those of us who know what's right and wrong, you know, and care. Because these people who think that they, oh, the government, this is government-sanctioned murder. All I have to do is sit in my house and turn on a device, you know, uh, when they say to, and I'm a patriot and I'm getting paid under the money, uh, under the table. I'm getting paid money under the table or services or, you know, washing machines, new cars, gift certificates, that type of thing. These are not human. These are counterfeit humans. And I do not pray for them. I pray that only that they go to judgment. And I hope it's soon.
But um, yeah, the, the society is becoming one that is not worth existing. And that is a danger. And I point out to people from an intelligence analyst point of view, when you have to look at the globe, you have to look at the world. We are not the only entity in the world. If I'm looking at the United States experimenting on its own citizens, killing and torturing them, then I think, hmm, this country is a danger to mine. This country is a danger to China. This country is a danger to Russia. Are we going to let them exist? And that's my question I pose to people. You have to understand this is beyond the United States. The other countries of the world are watching, and we are now a uh, number one threat. If we do this to our people, they say we'll do it to them, and they will have to act first. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, that's know, I- a shield statement. And, and he, Karen, thank you for saying that. I had not thought about it that way. Obviously, John Glenn did in 1997, and when he began trying to get Congress to, to outlaw the use of the the implantation of humans. I'm sure that's what he was, that's what he was trying to convey. Or Jim percentage when he tried to get Congress to outlaw the use of space-based weapons because they're able to cook a person in their bed. The shell is picked up, but the inside is cooked. I want you to know that in 2013, I had a colonoscopy. I did not. I did not want to be put to sleep. And so I literally had the colonoscopy awake. The 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 uh, uh, gas, and I do have a gastroenterologist as well. But that doctor actually went through my colon first without letting me see what was going on. And when he went through, and I guess was was uh, confident that nothing bad was you know was actually happening, he came back through and he said, "Now you can look." And so he let me see what what they were doing, and how they were cleaning up the rest of the colon wall. But what he did give me pin, printed out on a piece of paper, y'all, was showing was showing me that at least two inches of my colon wall was cooked. It looked like well done meat. This is happening, and 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 those of you who are watching, and those of you who who have decided to keep silent, is happening to your mothers and to your children. It's happening to your favorite aunt and to your favorite cousin. It's happening to your sisters and your brothers. And the more you try and ignore it as a reality, all you're doing is feeding into the system. I have asked for my money back. I have asked for my tax dollars back because they're being used to torture me. I saw on C-SPAN in 2005, there were some government budget hearings and the statement was actually made that no tax dollars is to be allowed to be used for the purpose of torture. And I immediately wrote letters and said, I'm a woman who is reporting that tax dollars are being used to torture humans in America, and I'm one of them. It's important to understand that not just we are suffering, but children are suffering. Children are being exposed to Wi-Fi. And this is not exactly the way you all intended for it to go. But I do believe that it needs to be said, especially since they have that article to refer to as to what else is going to happen. But children are exposed to the Wi-Fi and the constant bombardment. And, and younger and younger children are being given cell phones, which they're holding to their heads. And the, you know what? The radiation from the cell phone really may not be giving them the injury or the wound or the illness. It's what it's what the men like these, Barrett Wolf and others, are doing to them. That's giving them the the injuries and and the wounds and the illnesses. However, they get to pretend like it happened as a result of the cell phone, not as a result of what I did to you in your bed last night, not as a result of what I did to you while you sat in your classroom during the day. The cover story. It's a very good cover story. Excellent point, Millicent. Yes, absolutely. And this is why I frequently say people don't know that directed energy weapons are actually being used on everybody. You know, and when people go to the doctor and say, oh, my left toe is hurting, you know, or it looks like I've got a pain in my right side. It's a very persistent pain, and I seem to have just developed it. This is because of remote energy weapons. And I've had it done to me. I've gone to the doctor with specific, you know, complaints. 
and 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 I've had that doctor say to me, and I love her, I love her dearly because she does know, but she'll she'll say, well now, this is hmm, I think this is this this or this, and I would say, now you know that's not what it is. And she would just look at me and smile, and I'll smile back to her. I don't want to get her in trouble because she is a humane person. She's a Christian, and she does indeed have um, integrity and, 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 and morals about caring for the people under her care. But I do want to say that doctors are indeed having their arms twisted uh, because of it. You know, it wasn't but just a little over a year ago that she... I went in to see her and all she did was bow her head down to me and I could see at the crown of her head, head that her hair was thinning and I knew she was being under attack. So even the good people, are, especially the good people, are under attack. Um, it seems that the person, Barrett Wolf, has access to anyone that tries to help me. And so he can begin to lean on them as well. Can't you understand the immor immorality of all of it? And yet it's our tax dollars that's paying them. Black budget dollars are still our dollars. Mm -hmm. you know, Millicent, this is so powerful. I, it just blows my mind. We have to put everything that you said into print because you're absolutely right. And I just speak to back up everything that you said, you know, um, these um, illegal surgeries. So sometimes people are forced into surgery by these fraudulent induced complaints. For example, as I'm sitting now, I want to stress that right now as I'm sitting, the men of Marcus, you know, run by Marcus Seila are now setting off my hip, which was damaged the first time I emailed the Bundesnachrichtendienst, German intelligence, to request a cease and desist. There they attacked me so hard, they damaged my hip permanently. Perhaps there's a chip in my hip. But as I'm speaking, they are setting it off, you know, systematically. And everything that you described, I experience exactly as we're speaking, you know, the systematic destruction of joints. Melanie Richan also has been, she has undergone surgery in her own home. They came into her room and she, she wrote at night and she just woke up with scars on her skin. So imagine that. And from Carl Clark, the MI6 whistleblower, we know that the intelligence agencies do it standard. Coming into homes, anesthetizing people, and then doing whatever the hell they want with them as a standard operating procedure. And it's very hard to understand why they would be doing something like that and this is i emphasize that we have to keep an eye on the fact that these are nazi tactics and that's because after the nazis were supposedly defeated that was all a big lie the entire second world war was just staged and funded mostly from switzerland and with the anglo-saxon banks but it was staged all throughout the entire communist system was staged by the same cartel holders you know so we have a continue and this explains why the nazi doctors were whisked away to the u.s and they continued in the u.s that was just a cover story you know they continued and they started the cia and they started the national clandestine services and now the defense clandestine services you see what you're talking about those black bag ops those black object of black operations that they engage in walking into people's houses in the middle of the night you know helicoptering down onto their roofs, breaking in through skylights and attic doors. You know, all the stuff that they pride themselves on, all the stuff is clandestine. They call it clandestine. And they think they can get away with it. They have, this is, this is the irony of what we have come to today, you know, within the USA and literally worldwide, that we have, you know, a Senate, we have a Congress that actually allocates money to the CIA for clandestine services to go in and mutilate and maul people in their beds like this. Yeah, and Absolutely. it's very- Horror. It is a total horror. And, and I want people to, when they're listening to our um, Millicent's story, because she said, how can it be? And I, I agree with Ramola that it's bigger than just um, you know the, the main perpetrator named Barrett Wolf here, um, because we see exactly the same thing done to Melanie Richan in Belgium, done to me as a program in Britain, in Germany and Switzerland. There's an entire human trafficking operation. And I want people to understand that when they're listening to Millicent's story, when they're suffering from, from stalking, they have to know they have to act fast because the stalking is just a precursor to the systematic mutilation of your body. It is. It's the same program. Yes. You know, when, you are, when you're already being systematically mutilated, know that you're most likely chipped to the hilt. And whilst they're shooting into your body, 
the chips in your body read out the stress on your organs as being fed to some university's test computer or maybe a school. Mm -hmm. so and that's, that's it, they have and to I, be, sorry. Yeah, and I think that's something to stress what Millicent is talking about. Actually, there are two aspects to what Millicent is talking about. One is the entire town knowing about it, her entire family knowing about it, and they're all fed cover stories. It's been really hard trying to figure out what on earth they've been fed, and both Millicent and I have been working on that and trying to figure out what are these cover stories that they've been fed, which essentially by their silence, their silence and their um, looking the other way, in a sense. And then you've got the institutionalized exploitation, on the other hand, you know, whereby Millicent, literally, it's being sold as a human subject, as a slave. This is enslavement. This is human trafficking, extreme exploitation, and it is enslavement. It is more than enslavement. You know, so she's being sold as a test subject to universities like Princeton and Stanford and um, Vanderbilt University who are actually engaging in neuroscience projects, robotics projects, artificial intelligence projects, in conjunction with the Department of Defense, in conjunction with NASA. You know, so NASA uses wireless body area networks, wireless bands, exactly. which involve implants, right, Millicent? Which involve implants. And then which also involve the radiation and the electromagnetic activation of those implants remotely, whether from satellites or from cell towers. So that's institutionalized exploitation where we have very large organizations taking part. You know, huge millions of dollars associated with this. And, you know, all can be traced back to this one person who is being utterly exploited, utterly enslaved. How is this different from what's her name? You know, Sally Hemings sitting in Thomas Jefferson's home and being used. So that's what's going on today. It's modern slavery. It is actually, it's also much, much bigger than that. And sorry, I keep interrupting and I, I should say that we will, no, no, we, will work, we will work through Millicent's case for as long as it takes, even if you have to yes. spend five or 10 episodes on this, because this is a bombshell. But I'm, I'm just trying to go slowly because Millicent knows her case, and Ramola knows her case. But for the general public to take this in, it's just like, it's too much. Like every sentence, it's, it's like every sentence throws over the image you had of the world forever. And I want people to, to actually digest what they've just been told. And I'm trying to put it into the context that you have to be aware the Second World War was staged. The Nazis were never defeated. The Nazis were one of the experiments done by the cartel, which was then followed by the experiment of communism. And that's why the communists did exactly the same thing. Remember the gulags? They were just like the concentration camps, just a different corporate logo on them. In China, China has been obliterated by the cartel because the Chinese communist model was again an experiment done by them. So now the US and Europe are being obliterated by exactly the same Nazi tactics. Because you can replace Nazi and communist, they are identical, they are just different labels, and you can replace Nazi with communist with psychopathic. And that's where everything that Dr. Paul Marco said comes in at the top. These systems are psychopathic. The psychopaths, the psychopath magnets, these pyramid organizations accumulate the psychopaths at the top and they coordinate all these systems. And that's why it is so psychopathic. And that's why the psychopaths, you know, Jacques Reis runs Nazi psychopaths in Belgium. Marco Seiler runs Nazi psychopaths in Switzerland. Dr. Bruno Karl runs pretty much the same Nazi psychopath tactics in Germany, as does Andrew Parker. And at first you think, how can all these different men independently run operations that are equally psychopathic and equally Nazi? And at first it doesn't make any sense and until you realize that these systems are all one. They are just different branch offices. And suddenly, and I, I, will, I just want to finish this off because there are also reports that there's, this, um, there's not just a BND, so BND is German, the German intelligence um, agency, there's a second, more secretive part, which is called the DVD. And, you know, there are reports about them and, and um, uh, what's his name, Christopher Story talks about them and um, explains how totally psychopathic they were. After the Second World War, they put out, you know, communiques saying, for us, the war is never over. You know, a bunch of totally screwed in the head psychopaths just wanting to kill and murder. And this DVD is now set to have infected MI6. It doesn't make any sense. Why would DVD is set to have a you know an actual office inside the MI6 building? Why would that be the case? 
It's because they are the same freaking Nazis. It's the same freaking Nazi outfit. All these intelligence agencies are by now so deep in deep capture that the CIA, MI6, KGB, BND, NDB, they are all part of the same Nazi conglomerate. And then when you think Nazi, suddenly it makes sense because you think, hang on, they exported Nazi scientists and Nazi doctors to the US. So you expect the Nazi infrastructure to reach into universities and reach into the medical profession and it has spread through there. So that's how to understand Millicent's testimony when she says, oh, I'm being sold to universities. If you have the old worldview that we are brought up with to think, you know, we've got universities and they are there for science and so on. It doesn't make any sense why the universities would do such Nazi stuff. But then you realize, hang on, the universities have been taken over by the Nazis, you know, by 1950s, the latest. So that's I how to understand to it. I'd like to show you a text message that I just received from an anonymous person. I hope you can see it. Can you all see that? Oh my gosh. Do you believe in medical death? Yeah. Do you know this person? Actually, can, can you just show it? I want to read out the number 186. Sorry, just show the screen because you can track the number. It's great when they send you threatening text messages. One eight six two two zero two zero one five seven. So plus one eight. I mean, is that the US number? The one and then the rest is that the US number? It is. It is. Oh. Yeah. Because I received threatening, um, you know, a threatening phone call as well. And you know what? We know that all these phone numbers can be can be tracked. So you know, we should send an email to the NSA or whoever's in charge, the FBI, to please track this you know, live. And now we can check live on the next forum what the F, the FBI actually did in the meantime, which I guess will be not. The but NSA and the FBI are indeed in charge. They are in charge of surveilling us, monitoring us, and exper experimenting on us to death. Yeah, so actually, they can... They it's can important to... to hmm? Sorry. Sorry. I guess it's important to, to tell people also that there are FBI a former FBI agents who are whistleblowers, like Ted yeah. Gunnison, and his um, affidavit is available in writing. It is signed and notarized. And also Gerald Susby, yeah. who has a website, they both talk about the criminality of the FBI. And the and CIA. Gerald Susby talks about both the CIA and the FBI, and in fact, so does uh, Ted Gunnison. Also, there were uh, over 200 FBI agents attempted to shut down Guantanamo because of the extreme torture there. So I'm not exonerating FBI because I know there is resistance involved as anybody else, but there are some good agents yeah. seemingly in that outfit. Absolutely. I, I think it's important to keep in mind that when, when a system undergoes deep capture, you have domain formation. So what you have is you have um, clusters of good people who then you know huddle together and then clusters of bad people. And when you want to recapture the organization, you have to spread the domains which are still healthy. You know, so that's why in every organization, the police, medicine and the intelligence agencies, you always have good and bad, always. But that doesn't, um, you know, distract from the fact that overall the system is still captured. Yes, and in fact, in fact, Catherine, looking at your pyramid concept, I mean, we're talking about systems in deep capture from the top. You know, these guys control everything. They control these agencies. They control the intelligence agencies. These are defense contractors from the very top. They are the ones who are running the arms gigs, developing the weapons, and running the false flags. You know, I want to bring in at this moment something that I watched yesterday, which totally blew my mind. It's the interview that Paul Marco did with Seven, you know, Solutionaries Media Network. And I don't know how many of you had a chance to see that. She's, in, she's most definitely somebody that we need to bring on our show and speak to because she has the solutions. And she speak, talks especially, Catherine, to what you were talking about, which is how the entire system has been grabbed, you know, and they are preying on us. They are preying on normal. We're just average people, if you think about it. We're all from different fields of endeavor. But they're preying on the normal, everyday, average person. You know, we are sort of the middle class. And they are these absolute freaks. 
who have amassed wealth of a generation and are completely preying on us. You know, I'm hearing a very funny sound. Is this, are you hearing it too? I did hear it. Yeah, I can hear it when you speak. Um, when I speak. Okay, is it still going on? You don't have your headset on today. No, or I do, do you? but you know, I've got yeah, earbuds with the microphone attached. You know, it, it could be it could be that what we heard was an electromagnetic attack because sometimes it um you know it picks up especially when you've got um you know these um earphones the cable yeah. picks it up. I can tell you the entire time that I've been sitting here and being hit. The latest for me this past week, ever since the article was published, was hitting me in the chest and lungs. So literally, they're hitting me in my heart, directly right here. You know, I've, and I kind of brought my meter just to show you. You know, and if I hold it against my chest, you can actually see. Ah. Oh my God, I, I've got exactly the same. So you're being hit with three volts per meter and six. That's yeah. staggering. The amount of energy. I, show yeah, you I can see that when you're turning it, this is insane. This is actually at my chest and, and from all sides, you know, because they like to hit the chest from the back, from the front, yeah. all the stuff. So that's what's going on. And I'm not playing the sound. If I played the sound, it would be quite disturbing. I'm sure. wow. So in wow. I can actually, as you were waving it around, I could tell that the beam is coming into you on the right hand side. Into, oh my and it, God, really? Really? Yeah, and what you can also hear is this yeah. uh, click, click, click. These are shots. Yeah, these are yeah. shots. So it's like it's like a it's like a machine gun. Yeah, but a exactly. magnetic machine gun. They're and pulses. So, yeah, yeah so the pulses, and they hit me as pulses. And yeah. um, in fact, last night when you were talking initially about how we were all being hit, literally, I'm sleeping with a loaf pan under my heart, and I can hear the hits. It's like somebody literally using one of those BB guns and shooting into it. And I'm, you know, so I was thinking, I'm lying in bed, I don't have my audio recorder here, but I, that's what I need to do next time. I need to sit here, bring the low pad and my audio recorder or my camera and, and record what they're doing, you know? Uh, you absolutely have to because both Karen, you and I, we remarked that when they open fire, it sounds like rain because metal deflects it. So every shot is here. And that is a machine gun. It's an electromagnetic machine gun. We are being machine gunned in our own homes and we know who's doing it. And this is so valuable that Millicent actually puts it like that because you know, in these pyramid organizations, they've got a lot of power, but when the system turns, the culprits, everybody's pointing their finger at the same people. So yes. suddenly you have a lot of people pointing at the same few people. Yes, and, and, and this is why we need to talk to Seven because she's talking about you know Seven Gate bringing the crime cartel down, expose them, because yeah. we are talking about a global satanic system yeah. that has taken over our best organizations, our best agencies, and is now running them in yeah. very satanic terms, which are essentially destructive terms. You know, yeah, and and you know what? Actually, the um, we should we should really work through. I want us to work through with the. That's why we're going so slowly because I want us to work through Melissa's case with yeah. a fine comb because it has so much. Every sentence of what she says, it's mind blowing. You know, and and then also you understand the case of Seven, um, Charles Seven, who had experienced insane corruption at the Royal Courts of Justice. And I, too, have experienced insane corruption at the Royal Courts of Justice. So transcripts were modified. They refused to give out the audio tapes and, 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 and. So, you know, and, and that's how we all hang together. And what's really important for me to, um, to stress is that the culprits in Millicent's case are, first of all, the perpetrator, who for now shouldn't be named. But Ramola is right that he is also, he will be made the fall guy they think he will be the only fall guy but we're so past that game now because the people who are really responsible as Millicent said they are the heads of the army of the air force of the navy and the marines all of them and every head of intelligence personally you know catherine uh the, i had a conversation with a fellow investigator in 2011 and it was off the off the record uh but he did say to me I would not allow, in fact, he said, I'm a Christian and I would not allow the government to make me lie to them. 
So yes, there was an indication that Barrett Wolf was lying, that he is uh, what saying to the community, saying to the area that he is working alone and working for himself when actually there's a much, much, much bigger agenda at play. And you know what's really important for me is that as we work through your case, we identify everybody who's involved, you know, and we name them personally because from, from just listening to your case, it's clear that there's a huge infrastructure in place. So there has to be entire satellite systems, software programs, program to read out your data, ship it to universities, ship it to police stations that they can, you know, see what damage this one guy supposedly has done. There are entire armies of stalkers, even if you don't notice them, who are monitoring you. They have to be there because they monitor you every single time, nonstop when you leave the house. And the same is also true here, by the way. You know, and one of the things that shocked me last week, so did the Swiss intelligence have this habit that when I, they have got their little um, training flats around me and right opposite below the satanic goat, there's a flat where the lights are on 24 seven all the time. So that's where they sit. And when I leave the house, they will have a stalker. There's a block of flats. And when I reach the block of flats, one of their trainee agents will walk past me, like really slowly looking at the mobile phone and grin at me. And this has been, you know, the actual, um, um, habits since whenever so but anyway so I watched the stalkers and one of the things that shocked me is that they are getting younger and younger and younger so what we have is these intelligence agencies not just having this huge infrastructure in place that you know when you mentioned that schools there's this primary school training based on your torture data it entirely resonates with me what Marcus Seiler is doing here in Switzerland, which is he's training up children. So the first person, when I went shopping the other day and I just walked to the shops, the first person to walk past and grin at me with their mobile phone and the usual perfectly timed, that woman was in her teens. But when I came back, the person who did exactly the same, again, perfectly timed, was a child. That was a 13 or 14 year old boy. Now, these are child soldiers. So what the entire cartel architecture does is that they are building up child soldiers who they're doing with them exactly with what they did with all the military intelligence people, which is trauma-based mind control. So in the UK, the entire blog posts where agents complain about the murder and maiming that they saw and witnessed and was done to them throughout their training. Well, that's exactly the same um, trauma-based mind control that you um, talked about, Millicent, and that's being done to you, you know? And, and these psychopaths at the top, they love maiming and murdering. They literally, it's their favorite pastime. And um, they're just thinking of newer ways to maim and murder, and they want to do things. They have all the money in the world and they are printing money, but they want to do whatever they do with a lot of maiming and murdering because they get off on that. So they now turn our entire societies, all of our science departments into maiming and murdering, you know, research. All our police stations are essentially lying to facilitate maiming and murdering by the intelligence agencies. And our schools, you know, the fact that you mentioned that your perpetrator has been given access to school children in past episodes, you know? And now you mentioned that your data is being read out by schools. People need to understand that it's not just happening in Tennessee. It's happening here in Zurich. Mm -hmm. It's the same system. That's how vast it is. It's happening in Boston. It's happening in Florida where and, and Maryland, where Karen has lived. It's happening where any target lives. Literally, I think targets are at, are at the hub. We're at the centers of all sorts of concentric networks radiating out from us, whereby we are being used in research projects, in multiple research projects. And everything has been pulled into this maiming and murdering network, as you say, Catherine, because let's call it what it is. You know, let's strip this language of research or scientific research of its euphemisms that they are using, you know. Um, They're torturers. They're torturing you. And people that have been tortured make the best torturers. I want to tell you how you're financing this program. You're financing it through your tax dollars, of course. And that's, I think that's an, that's an abomination in a way. It makes everyone a slave if they're paying taxes, number one. Uh, they're also financing it through child trafficking, which they really need to continue their, their work. They get, it's bigger than drug money now. 
child trafficking. Uh, they do it through organ donations. Organ donations are big business all over the world. They're, uh, they take them from live people because that's the only way it works. Uh, they're trading weapons for drugs. They're making money on that. Uh, also, in the United States, they have this thing called asset forfeiture. If, they, if you have something they want, uh, they'll pull you over and take it. They can do that. And Trump likes the idea, actually, to, to pull him in there. Uh, also, if you are an invest, if you're, if you're invested in any public traded corporation, you're financing this thing. Your tax dollars goes to all the universities. They run on grants. No university can exist without federal grants. So they get federal grants. So what I'm saying is if you want to be innocent of this, if you're a Christian and you want to say, hey, look, I didn't do it, it was the other guy, you can't. You know that they're, they're you know it's public, uh, that their Abu Ghraib happens. There's black sites all over the world. Guantanamo is happening, and you're financing it. It's happening with these, with these panel members. You're financing it. And if you continue to support uh, large corporations through what you buy or through your investments, you're part of this network that's financing this. So rather than saying, hey, it's not me, I'm not a victim, I'm not a perp, you're a perp. If you're contributing to these organizations or in any way connected to this, and you have to be, then you're a perp. So we need to get this thing cleaned up and we, we need to see who's responsible for this. It's your dollars, it's your dollars that you spend, it's your tax dollars that go to this atrocity that's happening. So, uh, I just wanted to bring that in. If we're talking about who's financing this, you are. That's right. That's my two cents. That's right. This, can you all see this? This is what it looks like and the exactness of their ability to shoot us. This is a joint non-lethal weapons directorate. Uh, it says that it's an in injury chart. So this is what they expect us to get when they shoot us in these areas. I'm going to send this PDF over and Mindy can attach it to the podcast. So every shot that they fired into your body, they knew exactly what they were doing. Every shot Absolutely. they fired into your roller, into Karen Stewart, into me, they know exactly what they're doing. This is premeditated, premeditated mutilation and murder. And therefore, when the police write shit like that, that when you're reporting, your premeditated mutilation and murder, and they just say, oh, we suspect you've psychologically changed. Well, that is being an accessory to murder, right? That's what oh, I, do need to, I do need to tell you, though, Catherine, that when they say we have mental illness, they are actually saying that we have chips in our brain. Well, kind they of. Get to us, they know that we have chips in our brain, and they have labeled us mental ill. Yeah, possibly. Actually, maybe that's a good point. That's the internal code of, oh, ignore that because she's part of our research subjects. We're studying her chips. Exactly. I think very, very, very good. Um, you know, what's also very important to say is that I spoke at the military HQ in Switzerland to a senior guy uh, of, the Nash, of the NDB, the Swiss intelligence, and he said, he confessed that, yes, microwave weapons exist, but also he confessed that he gets lots and lots of reports of people complaining about microwave weapon attacks and chips in their head. So he confessed that he, this is going on, you know. And he actually and, said they exist, right? Because we've talked about this before, I know, when at, at the time that you talked to him. Absolutely. And, because that's um, disclosure. And, you know, we need to record that, actually. I should get that statement from you. Um, oh, yeah, yes, we will, we will. And actually, the, one of the things I wanted to announce is that we're now ramping up the work of the um, joint investigation team. So um, we are going to go through Millicent's case 
you know, in greatest detail. It's one of our flagship cases. In fact, our five um, um, uh, uh, joint investigation team members are, first of all, criminal investigators and victims at the same time. So we understand very well what's being done. We do have a sense of urgency, but we're also trying to do the work which the police refuses to do. So we have to, unfortunately. Um, but what we are looking for is, um, so when you're listening to, um, to Millicent's case, think about what happened to you um, also, um, think about this type of evidence that she co collected, the nuclear bone scan, for example, because we have to figure out how to find these chips really quickly. And what we're now working on is, well, the way to think about it is like a chopper taking off, a helicopter taking off. So the blade started turning and the first revolution is extremely slow. So we're working through Millicent's case as one of these examples, but then the things, um, the, the test, um, sorry, the case details will repeat. So that's why I went through um, in greatest detail through the Frederick LaRoche case because entrapment, you will have experienced entrapment if you're a victim and Millicent has all this medical data. So we need to figure out how to do all the measurements, how to get the evidence and then how to go after these corrupt people. And I want to show you that already with just one case, whatever nonsense they do, you can pick up a lot of names and these names will be criminal conspirators. And it doesn't matter if they are police officers, psychiatrists, or judges, or doctors, or you know, school teachers, it doesn't matter. They can all be part of the same criminal conspiracy, and we're now collecting names. So um, you know, the joint investigation team has been put into place. Millicent is one of our test cases, but we are also working to try to help other victims. At the moment, I'm very intensely trying to help Frederick, but um, also, um, we need to put things into place that we can help other victims at the same time. So I, I, I have finite time and we only have five people and we're also victims. So that's why we can't answer all the emails we're sent. We can't deal with all the victim cases. But what we're putting into place now, and that will be um, discussed next week, is we are preparing an affidavit template so that whatever happened to you, because we get a lot of emails where people describe in greatest detail the torture they suffered. This is really important, but because there are so many, I think the number of victims run into the millions, we can't deal with everything. So we have to put in a mechanism that we can help all the victims who are like Millicent and who are like us. And the way we do it is we first collect all the affidavits and within one affidavit, we'll, we will, um, the affidavit template that I've prepared will um, have section headings where you can write down what exactly happened to you, all the different offenses, you know, break-ins, entrapment, medical mutilation, you know, all the different things. And the, the, um, the important thing is that everything that happens to you will have a section number so that different affidavits put the same information, for example, break-ins under the different section number. So when we've collected these affidavits, we can very quickly go through different affidavits and see what are the tactics they are using for break-ins, what sort of mutilation they do. And we can correlate that to patterns and so on, but most importantly, we can put it before a judge and we can show him that what all these people are reporting, no matter how unlikely it sounds, it's all the same program. And because they are running the same program globally, we can take affidavits globally and we can compare them and actually get this across to a judge. And the other thing... Catherine. Oh, go ahead. Well, uh, Melisent, it's the end of the two-hour time limit, and uh, I'm sure we'll get right back into this hot and heavy next time. Uh, this was a shocking, a shocking episode. Uh, I'd like to end up, like we always do, having everybody say their final word and then kind of hang on for us after we leave. Uh, Millicent, would you like to start or, or why don't you start and we'll just go that way? I just wanted to tag on to what Catherine said, and I think that's a good statement for me to end with, and that is all around the world people are being mistreated in this way. I have seen at least 10 other people's body scans that was done by that private investigator, and only three of us have as many chips that loads the body up. Unfortunately, we're all three African-American. Two of us are women. Um, the one man whose body scan that I've seen that is also our African-American who is loaded with chips as I am, his two sons have also been um, 
scanned and they are also loaded with chips. So I'm not saying it is primarily African American. I'm just saying that they don't seem to care who they take or how they take them. Also, as far as trying to determine why, why me, why is it any of us? Why is it that young man and his two his his two little boys? Why was it me and my two little girls? Why do any of us lose our family members to this horrible thing? Perfect. Thank you, Millicent. Karen, Karen, you're, you're muted. Okay, there you go. I've got noise in the background here, so I wanted to make that uh, the least uh, distracting as possible. Um, like I said before, Millicent's case is a horrific case, but it tells us so very much that we have hope of taking some of the stronger cases as far as they can go and basically breaking through this uh, ceiling of silence. Um, I'm hoping at some point to shock the nation back into because no nation can survive that basically is predator prey and has this this uh, regard for sociopathy as the way to go. Um, we will self implode and those people who think that well we're on top we're, we're going to be the last one standing. Well, you're going to be the last one standing on a sinking ship because you're going to have no human being <laughs> work right. anything in existence with you. And uh, you basically are destroying civilization, destroying the United States, and destroying humanity. That's all you're doing. And you're doing it for a big screen TV. You're doing it for a new riding lawnmower. You're doing it to be part of a secret society of the dregs of the earth. Wow, you must be so very proud. And I will also say with uh, Millicent's uh, um, uh, basically uh, talk about the, the people who are saying, why me? It's just, like, uh, it's just like a hawk swooping down and grabbing the nearest sparrow. Don't waste your time saying, why me? Because 99% of the time, there is no reason other than you were, maybe were a decent person and said no to a sociopath or a psychopath Absolutely. or the truth when somebody didn't want you to. Is that something you would change? You know, and I know I'm one of the few people who knows that I was targeted for being a whistleblower for speaking the truth. But you know what? I can't change that. And if I could, I wouldn't because that's me all of you so don't waste your time with saying why me go ahead and try to figure out how do i help and i've said this before it doesn't matter if you're a, a housewife and you're sitting here watching this something that spurs something that you think of and you come back and you tell us or you tell five other people you know and then that means the end of all this so all of us are involved we're not as far as like the three, four, five of us, you are, because you are participating by listening, you are participating by thinking about what we're saying, you are participating by giving us new ideas, giving us research that you found, uh, or even just criticism saying, hey, you need to talk more about this and less about that. You, we are all participating. This is a forum for everyone. So please do participate, give your input. It's needed, it's valued. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Catherine. Yeah, I, um, I, I think what we have to, what we, um, we will take in everything that, um, you know, that Millicent says, and I think from the next episode onwards, we will think about what to do about it because um, we are appealing for help and, um, People want to help. I think there are a lot of people who want to help and they just don't know how. And I would just like to say a couple of things. Actually, one, one last thing I forgot to mention. I forgot to mention that it was very important that I do mention it because um, Frederick Roche, and now this actually fits into how to help. Let me just share my screen again um, because he has to had to open a crowdfunding site and it's here called, um, I will, we will put the link um, below the YouTube channel. And um, this is Frederick Laroche. And he says, um, you know, please um, help with my medical care. And he needs 5,000 euros very urgently um, for his medical expenses because they are forcing him to, to pay for every day that he's in the hospital 
So they're also trying to um, financially cripple him. And um, you can help by either donating or if you can't donate, to please ask around because there's so much money in the system and we are all connected, you know, we are all connected through, um, um, you know, the, the, the three and a half degrees of freedom or whatever it's called. So every one of us can send a tweet or an email to somebody who can donate. And um, the way we need to cycle the system and that can only be done through information, through action and through money. You know, and we need money right now for these specific flagship cases. Also, Millicent and Ramol and Karen and I, we also have um, um, a donation site. So on my website, stop007.org, if you go to support our fighters, you will find the, um, the crowdfunding sites or the, the PayPal donation for all of us. So you can, first of all, help by giving us money because we, we have to sometimes pay for expenses. Second of all, you can help us by passing on this information, by forcing people to actually watch the information in here. Uh, also, all our videos, the Techno Crime Fighters Forum is um, a public broadcast, a public interest broadcast, so you're free to upload it to your site as well, or you know, take snippets of it and then pass it on to other people. You're free to translate it to your language or add subtitles if you like, and all of these things help us because we need to reach people. And the third way, if you are still in the system, you can act. So if you're in a government department, if you're working for an intelligence agency, for the police or for hospitals, you can demand internal inquiries and you can force your colleagues back to integrity. And you should. That's the most powerful way to recapture the system from the inside. You know, and, and Bill Binney also advocates, you know, positive infiltration, you know, and positive recapture. That's the only way to recapture it. That's all for me. Thank you very much, Catherine. It's really important that you uh, support the Crime Fighters Forum uh, financially because that's what keeps them going. Uh, they can only bring this to you if they can afford to survive. Uh, thank you. And Ramola, would you like to end up? Sure. I'd just like to echo what you and Catherine have touched on, financial. We do need financial support. And I wanted to say that when people send money to us, it goes right back out. Because the, the, the few donations that I've gotten through my website, I have been happy and honored to send out to other people who really need it. And I will continue to do that. And I think all of us are in that state. You know, first, we have our own expenses, but we're also trying to help others. The other thing I wanted to mention is, once again, bringing focus back to Millicent's article, because I've been spending so much time on it and working on it for so long, what I want to say is, literally, I see Millicent's article as a sort of um, mind-blowing, very central cornerstone flagship article for all of humanity. And I think this article, and uh, this case, really, Millicent's story, her experience, her case, is going to be a doorway for all of us to begin to really challenge at a very visceral level, every single community around us, the military intelligence community, the academic community, the research and scientific community, the psychiatric community, you know, the police and law enforcement community, everybody, everybody you can think of, because there is corruption everywhere around us. And it's not just corruption, you know, it is an institutionalized conspiracy of exploitation. We need to challenge it. And we need to bring it down. And perhaps Millicent's article and her story really can show us the way. So I right, ask everyone to go good. and read the article. <laughs> yeah, please read that article. It's very interesting. It's very detailed, a lot of information. I'd like to finish by saying, what side are you on? Are you on the perpetrator's side or are you on our side? You need to decide that this week. And if you decide you're on our side, let's just get together and move things forward. You can do it through donations. You can do it through stopping supporting these institutions that are taking federal grants, the corporations that are poisoning people and manufacturing these weapons, and the corporations that are setting up franchises for this thing. So here's your challenge. Choose your side. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, the Techno Crime Fighters Forum 11. Uh, God bless and see you next week.